Welcome to this week's presentation. In this presentation, we are going to consider the chapters of Alma, chapters 30 through 31. The story of Korhor and Alma. There's a lot of doctrine involved here, and hopefully some of this will help explain some of it and give you added insight. So let's begin with an introduction to 3031. Chapters 30, 31 of Alma identified people and ideas that opposed Jesus Christ. President Ezra Taft Benson said, The Book of Mormon brings men to Christ through two basic means. First, it tells in a plain manner of Christ and his gospel. The second, the Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ. It confound, confront, confounds false doctrines and lays down contention. It fortifies the humbler followers of Christ against the evil designs, strategies, and doctrines of the devil in our day. The type of apostates in the Book of Mormon are similar to the type we have today. God, with his infinite foreknowledge, so molded the Book of Mormon that we might see the error and know how to combat false educational, political, religious, and philosophical concepts of our time. End of President Benson's quote. By studying how Korahor sought to destroy the faith of the Nephites, you will better recognize those same directive arguments in our day, destructive arguments in our day. By studying Alma's response to Korahor, you will be better prepared to defend yourself and others from those who would destroy your faith. So, let's now begin with Alma chapter 30. Chapter 30, verses 1 through 5. Whenever people live the gospel, whenever they live in harmony with the statutes and ordinances God has given them, whenever they follow the light of their conscience and subscribe to the rules and standards established for those of the household of faith, they come to know the peace of the Spirit. Keeping the commandments brings the quiet assurance that one's course in life is pleasing in the sight of God. A conscience, conscientious a consciousness of victory over self, which we know as spirituality. Learn of me, listen to my words, walk in the meekness of my spirit, and you shall have peace of mind, Doctrine and Covenants 1923 states. Chapter 30, verse 6, Antichrist. The Bible Dictionary states that an antichrist is anyone or anything that counterfeits the true gospel or plan of salvation and that openly or secretly is set up in opposition to Christ. The great antichrist is Lucifer, but he has many assistants, both as spirit beings and as mortals. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, further taught, An Antichrist is an opponent of Christ. He is one who is in opposition to the true gospel, the true church, and the true plan of salvation. He is one who offers salvation to men on some other terms than laid down by Christ. Sherem and Korhor were Antichrists who spread their delusion among the Nephites. Here we find an interesting definition of Antichrist, one who defies and denies the prophecies concerning the coming of Christ. This definition would, of course, pertain primarily to those who lived before the millennium of time. In our day, we would speak of an Antichrist as one who denies the divine birth of Jesus, who downplays the significance of his teachings, who claims that Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection have no significance for mankind. Many in this dispensation have been seduced in the damnable heresy that Jesus was merely a good man, a brilliant speaker, and a loving and tender example of mercy and forgiveness. These things alone. The restored gospel, especially as made known through the Book of Mormon, testifies that Jesus Christ was and is divine, that he is God. Chapter 30, verse 7, the phrase, a law which should bring men on to unequal grounds. That is, the Lord and his servants had forbidden discrimination according to belief. The Lord desired that all his children in all ages accept the gospel and affiliate themselves with the true church. 
He is not bringing this to pass, however, through pressure or unrighteous dominion of any kind. The Nephite society, though theocratic in nature, did not require non-members of the church to accept purely gospel laws, except as those pertain to the behavior and life in society. Nor did it make it disadvantageous in society to remain outside the faith. Chapter 30, verse 10, the phrase, if he murdered, he was punished unto death. Capital punishment was in effect among the Nephites. It was the law in ancient Israel and was carried to the new world by this, this group of Hebrews. Laws of justice, equity, and rep reparations, a vital part of uh, Israelite, is, Israelite's social and religious life, were perpetuated among the Nephites. Chapter 30, verse 11, the phrase, there was no law against a man's belief. If there was no law against a man's belief, some people might ask why Korhor was arrested. King Mosiah had issued a proclamation declaring that it was against Nephite law for any unbeliever to persecute any of those who belong to the church of God. So Korhor is brought to chief to King Mosiah, not because of his belief, but because of breaking the law of persecution. Clearly, Korhor was entitled to his beliefs, but when he sought to destroy the church, he broke King Mosiah's proclamation. It is interesting to note that whereas many in Zarahemla embraced Korhor in his teachings, the people of Ammon, who had lived most of their lives following Korhor-like beliefs, caused that he should be carried out of the land. They understood the danger of Korahor's teachings. Chapter 30, verse 12, Modern Day Korahors. Elder General N. Lund, formerly of the Korma 7, explained that Korahor has many modern day equivalents. Quote, Today the world is per 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 permeated with philosophies similar to those taught by Korahor. We read them in books, we see them championed in the movies and on television, and hear them taught in classrooms and sometimes in the churches of our time. We see clear evidence of Mormon's inspiration to give us a full account of Korahor and his teachings. Korahor's teachings are old doctrine, and yet they are ideas as modern as today's high-speed printing press and satellite dishes. End of quote. Chapter 30, verses 13 through 18, Strategies of Korhor. One gospel scholar explained how closely Korhor's philosophy aligns with many modern philosophies. Quoting, Korhor insisted on a strictly rational and scientific approach to all problems, anything else being but the effect of a frenzied mind. He crusaded against the tyranny of ancient traditions and primitive superstitions, which led people to believe things which just are not so, calling for an emancipation from the silly traditions of their fathers. He called for a new morality with the shedding of old inhibitions. He called for economic liberation from priestly exploitation, demanding that all be free to make use of, what, uh, of that which is their own. He preached a strict nonsense naturalism. When a man was dead, that was the end thereof, and its corollary, which was a strict materialism. Every man fared in his life according to the management of the creature. From this followed a clear-cut philosophy of laissez-faire. Therefore, every man prospered according to his genius, and every man conquered according to his strength, with right and wrong measured only by nature's iron rule of success and failure. And whatsoever a man did was no crime. It was survival of the fittest applied to human behavior, and the removal of old moral and sentimental restraints was good news to many people, causing them to lift up their heads in their wickedness, yea, leading many away to commit whoredoms. Along with his attitude of emancipation, Korahor cultivated a crusading zeal and intolerance of any opposition, which has been thoroughly characteristic of his school of thought in modern times, calling for opposition foolish 
silly, and the evidence of frenzied and deranged minds. And while for Alma free society is one in which anybody could think and say what he chose, for Korahor the only free society was one in which everyone thought exactly as he thought. Isn't that interesting? The truth can tolerate non-truth, but the wicked and non-truth cannot tolerate those who have the truth. Thus we see that the Book of Mormon is everlastingly relevant. It is, one, it is a once timeless and timely. It is at once timeless and timely. President Ezra Tackmanson has taught us repeatedly that the Book of Mormon was written for our day. He writes, quote, The Nephites never had the book, neither did the Lamanites of ancient times. It was meant for us. Mormon wrote near the end of the Nephite civilization. Civilization, under the inspiration of God, who sees all things from the beginning, he abridged centuries of records, choosing the stories, speeches, and events that would be most helpful to us. Each of the modern, major writers of the Book of Mormon testified that he wrote for future generations. If they saw our day and chose those things which would be of greatest worth to us, is not that how we should study the Book of Mormon? We should constantly ask ourselves, why did the Lord inspire Mormon or Marina or Alma to include that in his record? What lesson can I learn from that to help me live in this day and age? End of quote. President Benson has further explained, quote, The Book of Mormon brings men to Christ through two basic means. First, it tells in a plain manner of Christ and his gospel. It testifies of his divinity and the necessity for a redeemer and the need of our putting trust in him. It bears witness to the fall and the atonement and the first principles of the gospel, including our need of a broken heart and a contrite spirit and a spiritual rebirth. It proclaims we must endure to the end in righteousness and live the moral life of a saint. Second, the Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ. It confounds false doctrines and lays down contention. It fortifies the humble followers of Christ against the evil designs, strategies, and doctrines of the devil in our day. The type of apostates in the Book of Mormon is similar to the type we have today. God, with his infinite knowledge, so molded the Book of Mormon that we might see the error and know how to combat false educational, political, religious, and philosophical concepts of our time. End of quote. That was the second time of the use of this quote, showing how important that quote by President Benson truly is, and that we study it and internalize it. Chapter 30, verse 13, the phrase, bound down under a foolish and a vain hope. Here, Korahor seeks to make the believers self-conscious for holding forth the belief in that which is to come, in the unseen, in that which mortal ear has not heard. He plays upon their sense of security by suggesting they are bound down, yoked by their acceptance of specific religious beliefs and practices. Few things are more threatening to a people than to suggest that they are blindly obedient, or worse yet, that they are slaves to their religious way of life. The natural man is prone to lash out with, No, I am not a slave. I can do as I please. Just watch this. Korhor, like his modern counterparts, offers to liberate us from what he thinks of as our naive worldview, to set us free from ourselves. On the other hand, the wisest among us, those who find satisfaction in serving God and keeping his commandments, those whose system of values and feelings of personal worth derive from sources vertical rather than horizontal, say, I obey because I choose to do so. I do these things because they are what I truly want to do. I am free to choose, and this is what I choose to do. End of quote. Isn't that interesting? That Korhor tries to get us to think that the use of our agency is inappropriate, that he is the only one that has the right way of agency, and that we are not free to choose. You have to choose his way. He is going to use unrighteous dominion and coercion to coerce people into his beliefs. Chapter 30, verse 13, the phrase, No man can know of anything which is to come. 
This is a denial of prophecy, a denial of any knowledge beyond that which we have at the present moment. Antichrist, always natural men, consider things of the spirit to be foolish. Their tightly controlled epistemology system does not permit the discussion, and certainly not the acceptance, of such things as spirit or revelation or inspiration. This is also contradictory. It is not it is not known it is not know that you cannot know of things to come to acknowledge you know of things to come. Let me try that again. It is not to know that you cannot know of things to come to acknowledge you know of things to come. See, he contradicts himself. Saying that you cannot know of things to come, he is prophesying that he knows of things to come. That puts him in quite a bind. The apostates will always be contradictory and say such foolish things. Chapter 30, verses 15 through 16, the phrase, You cannot know of things which you do not see. Korhor's teachings that you cannot know of things which you do not see is the philosophy that all ideas and knowledge are derived from and can be tested by experience and that we can only know those things which we experience through our senses, sight, smell, touch, hearing, or taste. Since spiritual experiences involve revelation from God rarely pass through the senses of sight, smell, touch, hearing, or taste. Those who hold to core horse philosophy count them as meaningless. This position is a radical form of empiricism, a pure naturalism. To state it in another way, if I cannot see it, it does not exist. Isn't that just foolishness? I have not seen Australia, so that means it doesn't exist? This is the type of foolish tripe that apostates pass off as knowledge. The, this position is radical. Oh, if you cannot see, it does not exist. I can only deal with what is seen or felt or heard by the physical senses. From the world's perspective, seeing is believing. From the gospel's perspective, believing is seeing. President Boyke Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described an experience he had that illustrates the fact that spiritual matters do not typically include the common five senses. Senses. Quoting Elder Packer, quote, I will tell you of an experience I had before I was a general authority, which affected me profoundly. I sat on a plane next to a professed, professed atheist who pressed his disbelief in God so urgently that I bore my testimony to him. You are wrong, I said. There is a God. I know he lives. He protested, you don't know, nobody knows that, you cannot know it. When I would not yield, the atheist who was an attorney asked perhaps the ultimate question on the subject of testimony. All right, he said in a sneering, condescending way, you say you know, tell me how you know. When I attempted to answer, even though I held advanced academic degrees, I was helpless to communicate. Sometimes in your youth, you young missionaries are embarrassed when the cynic, the skeptic, treat you with contempt because you do not have ready answers for everything. Before such ridicule, some turn away in shame. Remember the iron rod and the spacious building and the mocking? When I used the word spirit and witness, the atheist responded, I do not know what you are talking about. The words prayer, discernment, and faith are equally meaningless to him. You see, he said, you really don't know. If you did, you'd be able to tell me how you know. I felt perhaps that I had borne my testimony to him unwisely and was at a loss as what to do. Then came the experience. Something came into my mind, and I mention it here a st I, and I mention here a statement of the prophet Joseph Smith, who said, A person may profit by noticing the first intimations of the spirit of revelation. For instance, when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you, it may give you sudden strokes of ideas. And thus, by learning the spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Back to President Packer. Such an idea came into my mind, and I said to the atheist, Let me ask you if you know what salt tastes like. Of course I do, was his reply. 
when did you last taste salt? That last, when did you taste salt last? I just had dinner on the plane. You, you just think you know what salt tastes like, I said. He insisted, I know what salt tastes like as well as I know anything. If I give you a cup of salt and a cup of sugar and let you taste them both, could you tell the salt from the sugar? Now you are getting juvenile, was his reply. Of course I could tell the difference. I know what salt tastes like. It is an ex everyday experience. I know it as well as I know anything. Then I answered, assuming that I have never tasted salt, explain to me just what it tastes like. After some thought, he ventured, well, I, uh, it is not sweet and it is not sour. You've told me what it isn't, not what it is. After several attempts, of course, he could not do it. He could not convey in words alone so ordinary an experience as tasting salt. I bore testimony to him once again and said, I know there is a God. You ridiculed that testimony and said that if I did know, I would be able to tell you exactly how I know. My friend, speaking spiritually, I have tasted salt. I am no more able to convey to you in words how this knowledge has come than you are able to tell me what salt tastes like. But I say to you again, there is a God. He does live. And just because you don't know, don't try to tell me that I don't know, for I do. As we parted, I heard him mutter, I don't need your religion for a crutch. I don't need it. From that experience forward, I have never been embarrassed or ashamed that I could not explain in words alone everything I know spiritually. Isn't that interesting? He could not do exactly what he was asking of Elder Packer. And because he didn't know, therefore, everyone else must not know. That is another sign of the apostates. They will equivocally affirm that because I haven't seen, I don't know, therefore, you don't, which is such a fallacy. Chapter 30, verse 16, the phrase, it is the effect of a frenzied mind. This is another way of saying that those who feel some need for redemption from sin are deluded, deranged in mind, and irrational, concerned with matters which need not trouble them. Chapter 30, verse 17, the phrase, every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. For Korahor, there was no need for an atonement, simply because there was nothing from which man needed redemption. Korhor was a secular humanist, as was Nehor, his predecessor. He believed that if success came, it was because the individual had earned it. If progress was made, it was because of the hard work, consistent effort, and fulfillment of one's goals. The humanist focuses upon man. Man is the measure. All things rotate around man. Man is the center of the universe. Man has the power to solve his own problems, to the power to make himself happy, the power to do anything he sets his mind to do. Humanism points towards man's genius, towards man's strength, towards man's work and accomplishments. It is an anti-Christian philosophy and is thus false, devilish, and destructive. It draws man's attention away from the one source which could bring liberation from the world's woes and give satisfaction and happiness in the world to come. It deflects one's vision away from Christ and away from that grace or an enabling power which comes from him. So the Antichrist will always focus upon man, that man is the center. Chapter 30, verse 17, the phrase, whatsoever a man did was no crime. We can now see why Korhor taught that there should be no Christ. From his point of view, there was no need for Christ, insomuch as there was no sin. This is a form of ethical, ethical relativism, a statement that there are no absolute truths and thus no absolute values, no rights and wrongs. One can appreciate why Korhor's doctrine was so well received by the worldly people in Zarahemla. If anything you did was right, that is a very appealing doctrine to those who do not want to repent of that which is wrong. Despite what some people in the world believe, the gospel teaches that there is no such thing as a relative value system. 
Some cultures seem to allow or even encourage this value-free approach to life, encouraging subtle forms of dishonesty in government, business, and personal relations. The Book of Mormon teaches us, however, that there is a right and wrong and gives us the key by which to judge. Core horse philosophy that a person prospers according to his genius and that every man conquered according to his strength precludes the necessity of God in our life. His philosophy that whatsoever a man did was no crime would create a self-centered and relative value system in man. Can you imagine the confusion that would cause? Whatever a man did was right. You could even justify murder on those claims. That would be a society of hell. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, exposed the selfishness in Cora Horse teachings. Quote, Some of the selfish wrongly believe that there is no divine law anyway, so there is no sin. Situational ethics are thus made to order for the selfish. So in the management of self, one can conquer by his genius and strength because there really is no crime whatsoever. Unsurprisingly, therefore, selfishness leads to terrible perceptual and behavioral blunders. For instance, Cain, corrupted by his seeking of power after slaying Abel, said after slaying Abel, I am free. Really, Cain? Free of what? He is damned to eternal damnation. I do not see that as freedom. Isn't it interesting? Because he could kill. I am now free. One of the, back to Elder Maxwell, one of the worst consequences of severe selfishness, therefore, is this profound loss of proportionality, like straining at gnats while swallowing camels. Today, there are, for example, those who strain over various gnats but swallow the practice of partial ab birth abortions. Small wonder, therefore, that selfish mag a mess of pottage into a banquet and makes 30 pieces of silver look like a treasure trove. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. Chapter 30, verse 18, the phrase, lift up their heads in their wickedness. That is, he encouraged them to feel pride in their actions, to feel no shame in their sins. See Alma 1.4. When a man was dead, that was the end. What we believe certainly affects what we do. That is, our behavior falls directly on the hills of our beliefs. If one believes that all life ends at death, that there is no continuation of the spirit following our mortal demise, then one might as well grab for all the excitement he can while he is still breathing. It is not surprising, therefore, that nihilism, a denial of immortality, should in many cases lead to a life of immorality. Why would you be moral if this was the only life there was? Eat, drink, and be merry, therefore we die, would be your philosophy. Let's now take a look at this chart. Korahor's philosophical foundations. First, he believed in what is called today epistemology. How do you know what is true? You cannot know what you cannot see or experience, was Korahor's belief. Therefore, you cannot know the future. You cannot see it. Therefore, prophecies cannot be true because you cannot see them. Therefore, you cannot know of Christ or of his atonement. Another part of what is called metaphysics today, meaning what is real, is a part of his philosophy. Men fare by their own management. Therefore, success depends on one's strength and genius. Therefore, there is nothing beyond this life. Therefore, man is the supreme reality. Another part of Coral Horse philosophy is what we call today axiology, meaning what is good, what is right. There is no God, no revelation, and man is the supreme reality. Therefore, there is no divine set of laws, no ultimate right or wrong. There is no absolutes. Therefore, Whatsoever we do is not a crime. Therefore, morals and values come only from human experience. And so you have relative morality. Uh, 
morality is just based on each situation. There is not a standard of morality. This is the philosophical foundation of Korahor. Now let's take a look at how Alma answers to Korahor. Korahor, you know, we don't profit from our service in the church, but you say we glut ourselves on the labor of the people. That should be the, sorry. Therefore, you deliberately twist the truth. I say, and we'll come to that in just a minute, Korahor, you know you cannot prove there is no God, but you say you believe only what can be proved. Therefore, you are not consistent with your own statements. Did you catch that, what Alma's doing? He just caught him in a contradiction. You cannot prove there is no God, but you say you can only believe what can be proved. Well, you cannot prove there is no God. Therefore, he is inconsistent. Korhor, you know you believe there is a God, but you say you do not believe in him. Therefore, you are lying to yourself and to us. Korhor, you know there are many signs that prove God lives, but you say you won't believe unless you see a sign. Therefore, you won't accept truth when it is given to you. I say, you are possessed of a lying spirit. Do you see how Alma combated his false philosophy? Notice what he doesn't do. Note Korhor's later confirmation of this in Alma 30.52. Korhor will say, yes, he did know. The first thing to note is that Alma does not get into philosophical debates with Korhor, nor should we with any Antichrist. He doesn't allow himself to be pulled onto the ground that Korhor tries to defend as the area of debate. There is a great lesson in that. We combat false philosophies with religion and true doctrine, not academic debate. That is wise counsel. That is exactly what Alma does. Second, Alma exposes Korhor for what he is. In effect, Alma says to Korhor, You know that we don't profit from our service in the church, but you say we glut ourselves on the labor of the people. Therefore, I say unto you, I say you deliberately twist the truth. It all comes down to one irrefutable conclusion. Korhor is a liar. All antichrists and apostates are liars. And so you can catch them in a lie. If you would just teach the doctrine. But there is more to Alma's answer than that. Alma takes Korhor's own philosophy and catches him in a trap of his own making. Korhor teaches that we can know only what we can see. But when questioned, Korhor categorically denies that he believes there is a God. Alma then asks, What evidence have ye that there is no God, or that Christ cometh not? I say unto you that you have none. Say it be your word only. You cannot disprove there is a God that is an impossibility to do. It is an inspired insight on Alma's part. Korhor is not consistent in his own thinking. If we truly can know only those things for which we have empirical evidence, then we cannot teach there is no God unless we have evidence for that belief. And Korhor has no evidence. Therefore, he cannot teach there is no God, even though he teaches there is no God. See the, con con the contradiction he puts himself in and the quandary he puts himself in? Chapter 30, verses 19 to 29. Again, we would presume that the reason why Korhor was apprehended was that he encouraged, through his preaching, the kind of actions which were unlawful in Nephite society. Korhor was inspired by the demonic and spoke with great confidence and audacity before Ammon and Gedona. Eventually, he was brought before Alma, who met his challenge with the power of God. Chapter 30, verse 23, the phrase, the teachings of ecclesiastical leaders. Here, Korhor challenges the institution and the authority of the priesthood by bringing charges of priestcraft and unrighteous dominion against the priest of the church. 
the high priest Gedona confronted Kohor and asked him why he spoke against the prophets and the re against the reality of Jesus Christ. Kohor evaded the question and mounted a verbal attack against the believers and their leaders. He sought to make it appear a foolish for anyone to follow their ecclesiastical leaders. Apostates will always do that. They can't answer a question. They will deflect and move on to something else. President Henry B. Iron of the First Presidency taught to the contrary. Quote, Korihor was arguing, as men and women have falsely argued from the beginning of time, that to take counsel from the servants of God is to surrender God-given rights of independence. But the argument is false because it misrepresents reality. When we reject the counsel which comes from God, we do not choose to be independent of outside influences. We choose another influence. We reject the protection of a perfect, loving, all-powerful, all-knowing Father in Heaven, whose whole purpose, as that of His beloved Son, is to give us eternal life, to give us all that He has, and to bring us home again in families to the arms of His love. In rejecting His counsel, we choose the influence of another power, whose purpose is to make us miserable, and whose motive is hatred. We have moral agency as a gift of God. Rather than the right to choose to be free of influences, it is the inalienable right to submit ourselves to whichever of those power we choose. We have the right to choose, but we cannot choose the influence that then will be foisted upon us because of the choices. We must face the consequences of our choices. We cannot choose consequences, nor can we choose what consequences will be. God chooses those. Another fallacy is to believe, back to Elder Irene, that the choice to accept or not accept the counsel of prophets is no more than deciding whether to accept good advice and gain its benefits or to stay where we are. But the choice is not to take prophetic counsel changes the very ground upon which we stand. It becomes more dangerous. The failure to take prophetic counsel lessens our power to take inspired counsel in the future. The best time to have decided to help Noah to build the ark was the first time he asked. Each time he asked after that, each failure to respond would have lessened sensitivity to the spirit. And so each time his, his request would have seemed more foolish until the rain came. And then it was too late. End of Elder Irene's quote. Chapter 30, verse 24, the phrase, I say they are in bondage. Like many today, Korhor taught that keeping the commandments and laws of God causes one to be in bondage. It lessens their agency. However, the opposite is true. God's laws and commandments free us from the bondage of sin, enable us to gain more agency to become like God, who has complete and total agency. The phrase, ye do not know that they are true. The doubt errs grossly through generalizing beyond his own experiences. What he has not experienced, no one else can. Because he does not know, no one, no one knows. Because he cannot feel, surely no one has felt. Because he is lacking in evidence concerning the coming of Christ, unquestionably the evidence amassed by every being Believing soul is either insufficient or naively misrepresentative. Those who dare not believe dare not allow others to believe. Isn't that interesting? Because I don't know, that means you don't know. That is such a false and fallacious statement. Chapter 30, verse 25. This is subtle. It is a carefully contrived argument which plays upon a truth to put forward a falsehood. To be sure, all mankind are fallen creatures as a result of the transgression of our first parents in Eden. The Lord, however, atoned for the original guilt associated with that specific act of transgression. A child is indeed not guilty because of its parents, but the child does inherit a fall or mortal nature through conception, a nature which must be renovated through the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. A common tactic used by those who are trying to destroy faith is called a straw man argument. This is done by setting up a false image, a straw man, 
of the truth and then attacking the false image in order to convince others the true image is false. A simple example of this is a child accusing parents who won't let him play until he gets his work done of not wanting him to have any fun. This is faulty reasoning, but it is often used to deceive others. Sometimes others claim that Latter-day Saints believe something that we don't believe. They claim that the false belief is false and then show that it is false. It has nothing to do with what we really believe, but it is an attempt to make us seem to be in error. Korher did this to Gedona. This argument is called a straw man. That is, he attributed to Gedona something that Gedona does not believe. The idea that children inherit guilt through Adam's transgression. Korahor knows that he cannot fight truth fairly and come off victorious, so he attributes bad doctrine to Korahor, a straw man to which he can give a good verbal licking. Chapter 30, verses 27 through 28. One whose motives are malevolent cannot conceive of benevolence, of motives that are pure. Korhor had a secret agenda, a quest for power and riches and fame, and he therefore assumed the same of others. Chapter 30, verse 29. Avoid arguments and contention. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that we should avoid contention. Quote, Let the elders be exceedingly careful about unnecessarily disturbing and harrowing up the feelings of the people. Remember that your business is to preach the gospel in all humility and meekness and warn sinners to repent and come to Christ. Avoid contentions and vain disputes with men of corrupt minds who do not desire to know the truth. Remember that it is a day of warning and not a day of many words. If they receive not your testimony in one place, flee to another, remembering to cast no reflections nor throw out any bitter sayings. If you do your duty, it will be just as well with you as though all men embrace the gospel. End of quote. Chapter 30, verse 30, the phrase, he went on to blasphemy. Blasphemy consists in either or both of the following. One, speaking irreverently, evilly, ab abusively, or scurriously against God or sacred things. Or two, speaking profanely or falsely about deity. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, quote, Among a great host of impious and sacrilegious speaking, that constitute blasphemy are such things as taking the name of God in vain, evil speaking about the Lord's anointed, belittling sacred temple ordinances or patriarchal blessings or sacramental administrations, claiming unwarranted divine authority and proclamating with pro profane piety a false system of salvation. End of quote. Chapter 30, verses 31 through 35, the phrase accusing them of leading away the people after the silly traditions of their fathers. Satan and those who follow him and profess his teachings always accuse God's leaders of false allegations, which Alma exposes. The Apostle John gave the following title to Satan when he said, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. The apostates and antichrist will always accuse the brethren of things. They are accusers. Satan is accuser of the brethren of false things. Chapter 30, verse 39, the phrase, I know there is a God, and also that Christ shall come. Alma here demonstrates the one thing that the believer can and should do in the face of opposition and challenge. Bear fervent witness and leave the rest to God. Alma knows, and he knows that he knows, and that is all that matters. He feels neither threatened nor trub overly troubled by any unbeliever, except as the unbeliever imposes his, sect his skepticism upon the innocent and the unwary. We just need to bear testimony. Heavenly Father is a big boy. He's a big person. He knows how to defend his own truth in his own church. We are just to declare the truth in all righteousness. 
Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained one way to respond to Antichrist, quote, Korhor ridiculed the foolish and silly traditions of believing in a Christ who should come. Korhor's arguments sound very contemporary to the modern reader, but Alma used a timeless and ultimately undeniable weapon in response, the power of personal testimony. Angry that Korhor and his like were essentially against happiness, Alma asked, why do you teach this people that there shall be no Christ to interpret, to interrupt their rejoicings? I know there is a God. End of quote. Chapter 30, verse 40, the phrase, What evidence that have ye that there is no God? We ask, have the united efforts of all the cohorts the world has ever known successfully proven there is no God? Had they proved that Jesus Christ was not uh, Jesus was not the Christ, the promised Messiah? Where is the man that could refute the testimony of those humble shepherds who heard the heavenly host sing, and who found the infant child wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger? Who is it that can come forth and refute the testimony of the wise men who followed the star and paid homage to the Christ child? Who is it that can discredit the testimony of John that the heavens were opened to him and that he heard a voice saying, This is my beloved son. The same is true of Joseph Smith in the first vision. You can deny it. You can rail against it. You can claim false things about it. You can be abusive against it, but the one thing you cannot do is you cannot, the apostate cannot disprove that Joseph Smith saw the Father and the Son. That cannot be disproven. Joseph gave his very life to make sure of that. Can the combated wisdom of the ages refute the reality of the resurrection? How can anyone prove that Christ did not break the bands of death? And what is the testimony of Joseph Smith and Sidney Redden that the heavens were open to them? What evidence does one have to an unbiased jury to prove that on a beautiful morning in the year of 1820, the heavens were opened and that the Father and the Son did not appear to the youthful Joseph Smith? How does one disprove the testimony of a prophet? We accept the feelings of the Spirit or we reject them, but we do not argue them. The Sadducees and Pharisees taunted Jesus for proof, yet when it was presented in overwhelming abundance, they continued to disbelieve. Brothers and sisters, the last thing the apostates want is truth. Be assured that when such people seek proof, that proof is the last thing in the world that they really want. As to the Korahors, we need not assume the burden of proof that is rightly theirs. If they assert we are without a God, without prophets, and without revelation, it is for them to prove it. We wait that proof. We await that proof as have the saints of God from the days of Adam. And we are still waiting for the apostates to disprove all of those things. Elder Gerald N. Lund explained the impossibility of proving there is no God. Quote, when questioned, Korhor Kor categorically denies that he believes there is a God. Alma then asks, what evidence have ye there is no God, or that Christ cometh not? I say unto you that you have none, save it be your word only. It is an inspired insight on Alma's part. Korhor is not consistent in his own thinking. If we truly can know only of those things for which we have empirical evidence, then we cannot teach there is no God unless we have evidence for that belief. And Korhor has no evidence. Korhor will consider only evidence that can be gathered through the senses. In such a system, it is much easier to prove there is a God than to prove there is not a God. To prove there is a God, all it takes is for one person to see, hear, and otherwise have an experience with God, and thereafter the existence of God cannot be disproved. But here is what it would take to prove there is no God. Now catch this. Since God is not confined to this earth, we would have to search throughout the universe for him. We assume God is able to move about, so it would not be enough to start at point A in the universe and search through to point Z. For what, what if after we leave point A, God moves there and stays there for the rest of the search? 
In other words, for Korahor to say there is no God, based on the very criteria he himself has established, he would have to perceive every cubic meter of the universe simultaneously, just to make sure that God's not there. You'd have to do it all at once. This creates a paradox. In order for Korahor to prove there is no God, he would have to be a God himself, because only God could see the universe simultaneously. Therefore, back to Elder Lund, therefore, in declaring there is no God, he is acting on faith, the very thing for which he so sharply derides the religious leaders. See, isn't that interesting? It always comes down to faith. It just depends on what your faith is in. Faith, Korhor's faith was in false philosophies of Satan. Chapter 30, verses, verse 41. Sorry for that extra 30 in there. The phrase, I have all things as a testimony that these things are true. To those who have hearkened to the voice of the Spirit, who open their hearts to things as they really are, all things bear witness there is a God. Alma will enumerate some of these things. Alma delineates the different ways in which God has manifested himself to people on the earth, means whereby Korhor and people like him might come to believe in him. To serve as signs as evidence that he exists, they include one, the testimony of Alma and his companions, two, the testimony of the holy prophets, three, the word of God is found in scripture, and four, the testimony of the cosmos, the assurance from nature's design and perfect organization that there is an all-wise and all-powerful creator. You would have to be an idiot to think that the cosmos and the universe came by chance. That is what is stupidity, not that there is creator. President Gordon B. Hinckley spoke of the power of God's creations to strengthen testimony when he said, quote, Can any man who has walked beneath the stars at night, can anyone who has seen the touch of spring upon the land doubt the hand of divinity in creation? So observing the beauty of the earth, one is wont to speak, as did the psalmist, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. Chapter 30, verse 43, the phrase, If thou wilt show me a sign. Korhor is banking on the prevalence of an important principle that generally speaking God does not give signs to the unfaithful. Antichrist know this. They know as does their master that signs follow faith that the heavens seldom if ever vouchsafe the miraculous and wonders in behalf of the unbelieving. And thus when no sign is given they feel they have evidence for their own position. Unfortunately for this strategy, as in the case of Sherem, an exception is made, a sign is granted, a condemnatory sign. Also, the Savior said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Thus, we can be confident that one of the sins of Korhor is that of adultery. And that is probably what he is trying to avoid of repenting of. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, whenever you see a man seeking after a sign, you may set it down that he is an adulterous man. End of quote. Later, the prophet noticed, when I was preaching in Philadelphia, a Quaker called out for a sign. I told him to be still. After the sermon, he again asked for a sign. I told the congregation the man was an adulterer, that a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And the Lord has said to me in a revelation that any man who wanted a sign was an adulterous person. It is true, cried out one, for I caught him in the very act, which the man afterwards confessed when he was baptized. President Joseph F. Smith further explained the dangers of depending on miracles for our faith. Quote, Show me Latter-day Saints who have to feed upon miracles, signs, and visions in order to keep them steadfast in the church, and I will show you members of the church who are not in good standing before God and who are walking in slippery paths. End of quote. Chapter 30, verse 48, the phrase, I do not deny the existence of God, but I do not believe there is a God. It appears that when faced with the possibility of physical harm, Korahor moves rapidly from bitter atheism to elusive agnosticism. Chapter 30, verses 49 through 51, the phrase that thou shalt be struck dumb. 
It would appear that Korhor, like Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, were struck deaf and dumb, inasmuch as the people had to write to Korhor in order to communicate with them. A more modern revelation explains the principle that condemned Korhor, quoting D.C. 63, 9-11, Faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe. Yea, signs come by faith, not by the will of men, nor as they please, but by the will of God. Yea, signs come by faith unto mighty works, for without faith no man pleaseth God. And with whom God is angry, he is not well pleased. Wherefore, unto such he showeth no signs, only in wrath unto their condemnation. Signs are for those who already believe to strengthen their faith. Chapter 30, verse 51. The phrase, would ye that ye sh would ye that he should afflict others? Elder George A. Smith related the following remarkable story. Quote, when the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was first founded, you could see persons rise up and ask, what sign will you show us that we may be able to believe? I, re I, re I, I recollect a Campbellite preacher who came to Joseph Smith. I think his name was Hayden. He came in and made himself known to Joseph and said that he had come a considerable distance to be convinced of the truth. Why, said he, Mr. Smith, I want to know the truth. And when I am convinced, I will spend all my talents and time in defending and spreading the doctrine of your religion. And I will give you to understand that to convince me is equivalent to convincing all my society, amounting to several hundreds. Well, Joseph commenced laying before him the coming forth of the work and the first principles of the gospel. Well, Mr. Hayden exclaimed, Oh, this is not the evidence I want. The evidence that I wish to have is a noble miracle. I want to see some powerful manifestation of the power of God. I want to see a noble miracle performed. And if you perform such a one, then I will believe with all my heart and soul and will exert all my power and all my extensive influence to convince others. And if you will not perform a miracle of this kind, then I am your worst and bitterest enemy. Well, said Joseph, what will you have done? Will you be struck dumb blind were you be struck blind or dumb will you be paralyzed or will you have one hand withered take your choice choose what you please and in the name of the lord jesus christ it shall be done that is not the kind of miracle i want said the preacher then sir replied joseph i can perform none i am not going to bring any trouble upon anybody else sir to convince you end of quote Chapter 30, verse 52, the phrase, I always knew there was a God. In his heart and in the deepest recesses of his soul, and in spite of his rebellion against light and truth, Korhor, like so many who profane the name and the works of the Almighty, knew there was a God. Alma earlier pointed out that Korhor was possessed of a lying spirit. To better understand the evils of lying, Robert J. Matthews, a former dean of religion at BYU, explained that, quote, the seriousness of lying is not measured only in injury or pain inflicted on the one deceived. Lying has a devastating effect also on the perpetrator. It robs the liar of self-respect and deadens his ability to recognize the difference between truth and error. When a lie is told often enough, even the one knowingly spreading it may begin to believe it. This was the case with the Antichrist Korahor in the Book of Mormon. The prophet Joseph Smith spoke of the tragedy of individuals like Korahor, quote, Nothing is a greater injury to the children of men than to be under the influence of a false spirit when they think they have the Spirit of God. End of quote. Chapter 30, verse 53, the phrase, He appeared unto me in the form of an angel. Satan is one who transformeth himself nigh unto an angel of light. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, Lucifer does not come personally to every false prophet as he did to Korhor any more than the Lord comes personally to every true prophet as he did to Joseph Smith. Such an appearance, either of God on one hand or Satan on the other, is however the end result of full devotion to the respective causes involved. In each instance, an earthly representative, by obedience to the laws that are ordained, may see the face of the master he serves. End of quote. Chapter 50, verse 53, There is no God. 
It is not uncommon to find such inconsistencies in the teachings of the perverse. Here we see that Korhor receives his commission from an angel who then declares there is no God. Whence then came the angel? See, why didn't Kor think about that? If there is no God, then there are no angels. How did you come about? Chapter 30, verse 53, the phrase, He taught me that which I should say. Just as the servants of Jehovah, who prove worthy, have it given to them what they should say, so Satan whispers to his servants that which he would, that which he would want said. Chapter 30, verse 53, the phrase, I taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind. Finally, we come face to face with the facts. Korhor wrested the scriptures, twisted the truth, and proclaimed a hedonistic and nihilistic way of life in order to appeal to those who sought religious license for their perversion. Indeed, as the Savior taught, a wicked adulterous generation seeks a sign but refuses to hearken to the voice of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is to focus on physical pleasures or material things rather than on things of the Spirit. It is hard for carnally minded people to experience the things of the Spirit. Elder Nell A. Maxwell noted that they are, quote, past feeling, having been sedated by pleasing the carnal mind, end of quote. Chapter 30, verse 53, the phrase, until I verily believed that they were true. We only need speak falsehood for a short time before we begin to believe and practice falsehood. We only need to fabricate slightly over time before it begins to be difficult to remember what the truth really is. In the case of Korhor, as his conscience began to be seared by the proclamation of that which degrades and destroys, presumably his value system and his way of life began to shift in order to be consistent with his beliefs. Chapter 50, I'm sorry, chapter 30, verses 54 through 56. This is not the action of an unkind or unmerciful person. Alma refuses to plead with the Lord for the curse to be taken away because he knows by the spirit of prophecy and revelation that should Korhor be released from his affliction, he will continue in the work of rebellion against the plan and purposes of God. Chapter 30, verse 60, the phrase, The end of him who perverteth the, right, the ways of the Lord. The lesson of Korhor is important, not because it is typical of what happens in this life to all Antichrist, but because it illustrates what happens eventually to all such persons. In hell after death, as well as in eternity, they are silenced as regards dragging others down to the declaration of degrading doctrine. And like salt that has lost its savior, they are forever cast out of the divine presence. Chapter 30, verse 60, the phrase, the devil will, no, no, will not support his children at the last day. One who in fa Faustian fashion sells his soul to Satan need not expect in times of difficulty any sense of fraternal or familial attachment, any type of protection or support from the arch deceiver. He who knows no love knows no family. He who is willing to promise salvation before the world was made will have no power to raise his own out of perdition. He is not one to be trusted. Indeed, he rewardeth his subjects no good thing. Satan will turn against you on a dime. That you can be sure of. Now, let's turn to Alma, chapter 31. Chapter 31, verse 1, the phrase, leading the hearts of the people to bow down to dumb idols. There is no mention in the text of specific gods to which the Zoramites had devoted themselves, except that the people were lifted up in the pride through their virtual worship of gold, silver, and fine goods. We are guilty of idolatry whenever the object of our adoration or devotion or the ardent desires of our heart is anything other than the true and living God. Whenever a people have strayed from the ordinances of the gospel and broken the everlasting covenant, it is not long before they become idolatrous. Look what Doctrine and Covenants 1, 15 through 16 says. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way, after the image of, of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol. 
which waxeth old, and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. That is the ultimate definition of idolatry. Well, I want to do my way instead of God's way. They walk in their own way. They seek not to establish God and his way. So whenever I want to do things my way in the church and not God's way, then I am an idol worshiper. Thus, not forgiving someone is idol worship because God's way is to forgive. And when you won't forgive, what you're saying is, God, I want to do it my way. So there are many ways we can commit idolatry. Chapter 31, verse 1, the phrase, his heart again began to stricken. There are few things more painful to one who knows, who has tasted of the goodness and know the love and power of the Almighty, than to witness the carelessness and waywardness of those who wander in the morass of evil. Those who have been partakers of the divine nature are sickened by the sin of their day and pain for those who revel in their sins. Chapter 31, verse 5, the phrase, Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the, try the virtue of the word of God. Who can measure the power of the word of God as delivered directly by him, as declared by angels, as contained in scripture, or as spoken by the power of the Holy Ghost? Here Alma declares that the word is the most powerful instrument for change known to mortal man, stronger than intellectual persuasion or military might. The word heals the wounded soul, nourishes the soul, cuts through falsehood, and leads one to Christ. It is the foundation for faith and results in firmness and steadiness, steadfastness in faith. Alma felt that he and his missionary associates should trust the Lord, trust in and rely on the powers of Herod, experiment upon the promises of God regarding the power of his word. All this in order to work a mighty change in the hearts of those whom they were called to preach. The virtue or power of the Word of God is in part explained by the fact that it is attended by the witness of the Spirit. The Lord said that when His words are conveyed by His Spirit, they are His voice. Alma considered resorting to preaching the Word to the apostate Zoramites, even though they had already heard and rejected it. President Boyd K. Packer explained one reason why we must learn the doctrines of the church. Quote, true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than the study of behavior will improve behavior. That is why we stress so forcefully the study of the doctrines of the gospel. End of quote. President Spencer W. Kimball spoke of the power of Scripture to help us draw near unto God. He said, quote, I find that when I get casual in my relationship with divinity, and when it seems that no divine ear is listening and no divine voice is speaking, that I am far, far away. If I immerse myself in the Scriptures, the distance narrows and the spirituality returns. I find myself loving more intensely those whom I must love with all my heart, mind, and strength, and loving them more. I find it easier to abide their counsel." End of quote. President Ezra Taft Benson explained how the scriptures can be a powerful way to bless us and answer the difficult questions of life. Quote, Often we spend great effort in trying to increase the activity levels in our stakes. We work dismally to raise the percentage of those attending sacrament meetings. We labor to get a higher percentage of our young men on missions. We strive to improve the number of those marrying in the temple. All of these are commendable efforts and important to the growth of the kingdom. But when individual members and families immerse themselves in the scriptures regularly and consistently, these other areas of activity will automatically come. Testimonies will increase. Commitment will be strengthened. Families will be fortified. Personal revelation will flow. End of quote. You can see why Satan then is so consistent and so determined to not get you as family and personally to study scripture. He knows the power that they have. Chapter 31, verse 8, the phrase, the Zoramites were dissenters from the Nephites. How often it is the case that those who were once enlightened, those who had once known the sweet joy of membership in the Lord's kingdom, become the bitterest enemies of the faith. Sinning against light always leads to grosser darkness. 
chapter 31, verses 9 through 11, they would not observe to keep the commandments of God and his statutes according to the law of Moses. Until the time of the Lord's anointing sacrifice was made in the flesh, faithfulness to the portion of the law of Moses prescribed by the prophets was prerequisite to divine approbation. Elder Bruce R. McKenzie has written, quote, We cannot always tell whether specific sacrificial rites performed in Israel or part of the Mosaic system or whether they were the same ordinance performed by Adam and Abraham as part of the gospel law itself. Further, it appears that some of the ritualistic performances varied from time to time according to the special needs of the people and the changing circumstances in which they found themselves. Even the Book of Mormon does not help us in this respect. We know the Nephites offered sacrifice and kept the law of Moses. Since they held the Melchizedek priesthood and there were no Levites among them, we suppose their sacrifice were those that antedated the ministry of Moses and that since they had the fullness of the gospel itself, they kept the law of Moses in the sense that they conformed to its myriad moral principles and its endless ethical restrictions. We suppose this would be one of the reasons why Nephi was able to say, The law hath become dead unto us. There is at least no intimation in the Book of Mormon that Nephites offered the daily sacrifices required by the law or that they held the various feasts that were part of the religious life of their old world kinsmen. End of quote. In Antonium, the missionary force of Alma and his companions came across a group of Nephite descendants known as the Zoramites. Mormon not only recorded that the Zoramites had previously had the word of God preached unto them, but he further identified the cause of their apostasy. They would not keep the commandments. They no longer petitioned the Lord daily in prayer. They perverted the ways of the Lord, and that prayers they did offer the Lord were vain and meaningless. They ignored the basics, such as having a daily habit of meaningful prayer and scripture study. As 35 years of a professional teacher in the church educational system, I have noticed amongst people that the first thing that goes in their life is prayer. That is the first thing they stop, and then other things follow, like scripture study, church attendance, temple attendance, etc. Elder Don L. Staley of the Quorum of Seventy emphasized the importance of daily consistency in the basics of the gospel. Quote, daily fervent prayer, seeking forgiveness, and special help and direction are essential to our lives and the nourishment of our testimonies. When we become hurried, repetitive, casual, or forgetful in our prayers, we tend to lose the closeness of the Spirit, which is so essential in the continual direction we need to successfully manage the challenges of our everyday lives. Family prayer every morning and night adds additional blessings and power to our individual prayers and to our testimonies. Personal prayer involve, personal sincere involvement in scripture produces faith, hope, and solutions to our daily challenges. Frequently reading, pondering, and applying the lessons of the scriptures combined with prayer become an irreplaceable part of gaining and sustaining a strong, vibrant testimony. End of quote. Chapter 31, verses 12 through 23, the phrase, They did worship after a manner which Alma and his brother had never beheld. The manner of worship of the Zoramites, as well as their perverse doctrinal orientation, is most interesting. Their worship was quite simple. On one day of the week, domi dominated the day of the Lord, or denominated the day of the Lord, the people would gather at their own synagogues, ascend one by one on the Ramiampton, or holy stand and, un and uniformly utter a prepared prayer. They seem to be possessed with the belief in what we would call predestination or unconditional election of individuals to eternal life. They viewed themselves as the elect, as the elect, the chosen, the holy ones, while others were doomed to suffer the wrath of God in hell. Even though the Zoramites killed Korhor, they seem to have adopted a similar belief system. Note the following phrases from Alma 31 that describe the Zoramite beliefs. They had fallen into great errors. They had rejected traditions that they felt were handed down by the, by the childishness of their fathers. They did not want to be led away after the foolish tradition of their brothers, which did bind them down to a belief of Christ. They refused to believe in things to come, which they knew nothing about. You can see that that is the same as Korahor. 
Elder Jeffrey R. Holland commented about Korhor's influence on the Zoramites' false teachings, quote, Korhor's brand of teaching inevitably had its influence among some of the less faithful who, like the neighboring Zoramites, were already given to perverting the ways of the Lord. Zorm and his followers are one of the most memorable apostate groups mentioned in the Book of Mormon, primarily because they considered themselves so unusually righteous. Once a week, they stepped atop a, power, a, a prayer tower called a Ramiumtum, and using always the self-same prayer, thank God that they were better than anyone else, a chosen and a holy people, elected by God to be saved, while all around them were equally elected to be cast down to hell. In the reassurance safety of all this, they were also spared any belief in such foolish traditions, evidence of Korah's legacy emerging here, as a belief in a Savior, for it had been made known to them there should be no Christ. Alma lost little time encountering such unholy prayer and its equally unholy theology with his own prayer for divine assistance against the form of self-serving iniquity that made him literally sick at heart. End of Elder Holland's quote. Chapter 31, verse 15, the phrase, Thou wilt be a, thou wilt be a free spirit. Here we gain a subtle insight into the doctrinal stance of the Zormites. They were antichrist to say that the God to whom they addressed themselves, presumably Jehovah, would be a spirit forever, was the same as saying that there shall be no Christ. That is, they denied the condescension of the great God, the incarnation, the divine sonship of Christ. I'm sorry, the title of that should be, Thou shalt be a spirit forever, not a free spirit. Chapter 31, verse 16, the phrase, Thou hast made known to us that there shall be no Christ. In the various apostasies, partial or total, that from time to time disgraced the Nephites, there was one characteristic feature that seems to be universal to them all, however much they may have differed in minor points. It was the denial of the coming of the Savior in the flesh and the necessity of his atonement for sins of the world. This was the evil one's strong point in his efforts to mislead the ancient Nephites. Let him but to persuade any people to reject this, the foundation of the gospel scheme, and little does he care what else they believe or disbelieve. For when this fundamental truth is rejected, their spiritual enslavement is secured. Whether the Zoramites had deceived themselves into dis had deceived themselves into believing that God had indeed spoken to them, or whether Satan or one of his dim demons had appeared or spoken in the name of God is unknown and immaterial, for the result was still the same. Chapter 31, verses 24 through 29, The Consequences of False Doctrine The Zoramites claimed to be a chosen and a holy people, separate from their fellow man and elected of God to eternal salvation, while all around were predestined to be cast down to hell. This atrocious creed naturally resulted in its adherents and advocates being puffed up in vain and consumed with pride, puffed up in vanity and consumed with pride. They became haughty, uncharitable, tyrannical, and oppressors of their poor neighbors. They covered their bodies with the finest apparel and profusely adorned their persons with costly ornaments of gold and jewels. In their arrogance and self-righteousness, they became the Pharisees of their age and country. But in other faces of iniquity, they far exceeded their counterparts in the Holy Land. They bowed down to idols, denying the coming of Christ, declaring the doctrine of the atonement to be a foolish tradition. And like many other sects of modern Christendom, they misinterpreted the teachings of the Holy Scripts with regard to the being of God. Chapter 31, verses 26-35 through 25. Alma's prayer in behalf of the Zoramites. This is a remarkable prayer, a heartfelt petition, peti petition. It is an honest expression of a righteous man, a declaration of his utter disgust with the sins of the people, an iniquity as to how long God would allow such perversion to prevail, and a plea for strength in bearing up under his burden. It also demonstrates how the Lord through the Spirit can transform the human heart, can turn a person around in his thinking, can bestow love where disdain once was, can cause one to change from denunciation and fierce judgment to tender mercy and compassion. At first, Alma is sickened by their sin. Then he pleads for strength. 
Alma asked for comfort in Christ. We notice that his prayer then continues as follows. O Lord, wilt thou grant unto us that we may have success in bringing them again unto thee, bringing again unto thee, bringing them again unto thee in Christ. Behold, O Lord, those souls are precious, and many of them are our brethren. Therefore, give us, O Lord, power and wisdom, that we may bring these, our brethren, again unto thee. Alma recognized that the souls of the apostate Zoramites were precious to God. Thus, Alma prayed for the power and wisdom to bring them back to the Lord. Alma's prayer exemplified the attitude all members of missionaries must develop. All people are of great worth, and through the power of God, they can be brought back to him. While serving as a member of the 70, Car Elder Carlos E. S.A. taught that all people are precious to God and should be to us, quote, the souls of our brothers and sisters, who may seem to be more feeble and less honorable, are precious. The church has need of them. We should make every attempt to know them and to help them claim the full blessings and joys of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our prayer should be as Alma's, give unto us, O Lord, power and wisdom, that we may bring these, our brethren, again unto thee. We must remember that our salvation is intertwined with the salvation of others. We must care more for those who seem to care less for their faith. End of quote. Chapter 31, verse 31, the phrase, Wilt thou conform my soul, and wilt thou comfort my soul in Christ? Comfort comes in and through Christ. It comes to us through the mediation of the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. The Spirit heals our souls, provides divine perspective, and points our minds toward those things which matter most. It is the Comforter who teaches us the peaceable things of the kingdom, the peaceable things of immortal glory. Chapter 31, verse 34, 35, their souls are precious. In modern revelation, the Lord explained that the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. DNC 1810, Latter-day Saints are fond of quoting this verse and then skipping down the scriptural passage to those verses that, spring, that speak further of the joy that comes from bringing the blessing of the gospel in the lives of many. The question might be asked, why is the worth of souls great? We might respond, we might respond that as children of the man of holiness, we have marvelous possibilities. As sons and daughters of God, we are possessed, although now in rudimentary form, of the attributes of godliness. The Lord provided an additional answer from Scripture. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffereth death in the flesh. Wherefore, he suffered the pains of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. And he hath raised again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. And how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth. Wherefore, you are called to cry repentance unto this people. Simply stated, the soul is, infinite, is of infinite worth. We are not our own. We have been bought with the infinite price, even with the precious blood of Christ, as of, of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Souls are a precious sight in the sight of God as they were, as they ever were. The prophet Joseph affirmed the elders were never called to drive any down to hell, but to persuade and invite all men everywhere to repent that they may become the heirs of salvation. Chapter 31, verse 36, the phrase, He clapped his hands upon all them who were with him. Presumably this means that Alma laid his hands upon their heads and either set them apart to their assignments or else bestowed a special blessing upon them before they were to face a difficult challenge. In any case thereafter, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. 30, chapter 31, verse 37, the phrase, taking no thought for themselves. As Doctrine and Covenants 84, 80 through 81, and verse 85 states, Any man that shall go and preach this gospel of the kingdom, and fail not to continue faithful in all things, shall not be weary in mind, neither darkened, neither in body, limb, nor joint, and the hair of his head shall not fall to the ground unnoticed, and they shall not go hungry, neither athirst. Therefore take ye no thought for the morrow, for ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or wherewith all ye shall be clothed. And neither take ye thought beforehand what ye shall say, but treasure up in your minds continually the words of life, and it shall be given you in the very hour that portion that shall be meted unto every man. 
chapter 31, verse 37, the phrase, this because he prayed in faith. To pray in faith is to pray having confidence in God. Alma's prayer, because he prayed in faith, was answered in blessings upon the heads of all the missionaries. Mormon notes that the Lord provided for their wants. They hungered not, neither did they first. Strength was given them that they overcome all afflictions. Save at time for God's glory, they suffered pain and anguish. But even through their tears, they saw his divine blessings and discerned his providential care. James, the brother of our Lord, knew much of the power of prayer. He wrote, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Further, pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helps you with some of the doctrines in these chapters, and especially that of the Antichrist and the apostates and how Satan tries to persuade people from the truth. If this helped you, hit the like button. Thank you.